Howdy, this is Jim Rutt, and this is The Jim Rutt Show. This is a Currents episode. Currents are shorter and less heavily produced than our full-length episodes and generally focus on a single topic. As always, links to books, articles, and organizations mentioned are available on the episode page at jimrutshow.com. That's jimrutshow.com. Today's Currents episode it has as our guest Michael Vassar, a longtime friend of mine and a very astute independent thinker. This, uh, the seat of this episode basically came from a, a phone call or conversation of some sort we had a few weeks ago. And I think I was proclaiming in my usual immodest matter that this was not uh, the revolutionary moment that the COVID this was and this was COVID-19 prior to the George Floyd event. Uh, and I said, this is not the uh, revolutionary moment. And, Mer- and Michael said, I think you're wrong. I think this is the revolutionary moment. Uh, but this is the passive aggressive uh, revolutionary moment. And I said to him, say no more, Michael, this will make a great uh, podcast episode. Uh, So, you know, things have uh, happened since then. So uh, first, what did you mean when you said passive aggressive revolutionary moment? And what do you think that all means now? So let's imagine that there was a moment of prayer across the country in across a large range of religious denominations. I think it would be hard to get the Mormons in for this, but I think practically everyone else could potentially be enlisted, at least for a few centerpiece uh, churches or uh, any other sort of uh, religious affiliation. Now, let's say there was an, uh, a some sort of attack by American soldiers or police against protesters who were behaving fairly peacefully. There was fairly good video evidence of this. And there was a nationwide moment of prayer for the defeat of the American military by the American people. That would be a great example of a passive aggressive military uh, revolutionary moment. We have good enough communication now in a way that has never existed before during a war to make opinions known in a different way, including making known on the battleground that you do not have the support of the troops at home. There couldn't be surprises, like with troops coming back from Vietnam and having things thrown at them. If people simply knew that on every, you know, in every office building, in every, you know, supermarket, in every manufacturing center, there were people who were going to church and praying for their defeat. And those were the people who were making their weapons. Those were the people they were hoping to come to after, home to after the war. You know, They might not actually resist, but they wouldn't exactly fight either for the most part. A few psychopaths would, but like, it wouldn't be much of a war. It would just be like creating the knowledge that, nope, we don't love you. We're not going to help. Your lives don't mean anything. If your deaths don't mean anything, they mean less than nothing. And that's all it takes. Only the American people can defeat the American people. We're the most powerful army the world has ever known, but we're also the best branding system the world has ever known. And the army mostly exists as support for our marketing system. The um, marketing system in a one-on-one one, one fight, I think it can win. Interesting. Uh, yes, I think that uh, that's an interesting concept. Uh, what about other actions uh, that might work in a uh, kind of passive-aggressive fashion, uh, which is uh, you know uh, things like rent strikes or uh, failure to pay your taxes or uh, I don't know what, refusal to send your kids to school or the school system loses their $15,000 a year worth of state subs, uh, state funding, et cetera. Or lowering the bond rating on Goldman Sachs. Yeah, exactly, right? There are a huge number of places where when you are fighting your own system, it's actually very easy to fight just by not trying very hard. You don't need to be as dedicated as at least the fictional Oscar Schindler, who the fictional version, who was determined to make sure that his factories didn't make good ammunition. In the Second World War, even with lots of good propaganda, we had factories making bad ammunition. We had torpedoes that didn't work three quarters of the time. Having torpedoes that didn't work 100% of the time, if you already have torpedoes that don't work three quarters of the time, having guns that jam, having tires that explode, you know, just 
having the lights go out in Washington, D.C. because of unaccountable technical errors that are no more outrageous than the technical errors that led to the Bhopal disaster in India. I don't know if you've read the documentary about it, but you just, you know, if you don't like your job and your job is any sort of information work, we've never actually managed the sort of panopticon that Foucault, you know, talks about, Bentham, Foucault, everything's always fundamentally dependent on people believing in what they did a little. That's why, you know, people get paid more in some countries than others to work identical jobs with identical manufacturing systems, for instance. Interesting. Uh, and uh, so the other, I guess the other parallel, this is kind of a baby version of the anarchists uh, old tactic of the general strike. It's a you know a, a partial general strike, not not even working too hard at the general strike, but just sort of uh, you know generally being uh, uncooperative. Yep, unenthusiastic, uncooperative, a little bit late. I mean, you know how the Qin Dynasty fell, right? Mm, no. What's the penalty for lateness? Death. What's the penalty for revolution? Death. Well then, <laughs> but the, the reason you get into that situation is because you can create a revolution through lateness. If you have a complicated imperial bureaucracy as large as America or as large as the Qin Dynasty, um, intractable paperwork delays, minor logistical snafus, you know, it takes a lot of people actually trying to get an army from point A to point B a thousand miles away. Even with modern technology, it takes quite a few people kind of trying. So I think I think you've convinced me that this could the, the, that the tactics of passive aggressive uh, could be used uh, to uh, instantiate a revolution. Uh, any sign to your mind that we're actually seeing that manifesting now? I think that was more my point that a few weeks ago, uh, before the George Floyd situation, uh, I wasn't seeing this uh, as the predicate yet for a revolution, whether passive aggressive or aggressive. Uh, but I would I would buy that a passive aggressive revolution is possible. Uh, is this a moment where we are seeing it? Uh, you know, of course, what we're seeing in the streets isn't really passive aggressive. It's more good old fashioned aggressive aggressive. So talk about that a little bit, if you would. All right. We are seeing a lot of aggressive, aggressive behavior in the streets, but it seems like there are so many provocateurs and false flags. It's kind of meaningless with the current information infrastructure to even try to decide who is starting things at any given an incident. But we pretty much know that in a very important sense, George Floyd did not start things by passing along a potentially counterfeit $20 bill. That's like a natural starting point because it took until I think today or yesterday for the police who stood by while he was murdered to be arrested. And if it is in fact empirically known that a fairly high level of social disruption and violence is required to get that, that sort of an arrest to happen, then it's fairly generally known that there is some sort of a force that is the initiator of violence here, some sort of more than local provocateurs breaking the windows of auto, uh, auto shops. We have a provocative police forces that have uh, given up any plausible claim to serving and protecting the people. And we have this not just in Minneapolis, because otherwise other police forces would have made efforts to distance themselves. We have to conclude that we have this all throughout the country, not meaning every police force. But when people say there, there are, you know, a few bad cops doesn't mean there are no good cops. Yeah, but you can, there's an upper bound to how good you can be and not be a whistleblower in any given organization. And this depends somewhat on what your situation is with dependents, etc. But I think it's fair to say that, like, when he released the Pentagon Papers, Daniel Ellsberg established the upper bound on how decent a person you could be and be a top-level U.S. military advisor. And when Chelsea Manning uh, released her videos of Americans murdering Iraqis, uh, she established an upper bound on how decent a person you could be and be even like a relatively low-level U.S. military officer. And... Snowden established a decent, an upper bound for how decent a person you could be and be someone who does contracting for the U.S. with a high security clearance. So there's this progressive decay of what plausible moral motivations one can attribute to a certain 
group of people. And to, at some point, you have to regard people as enemy combatants and therefore not entitled to trial. Like, if we've established a situation where cops believe that black people aren't entitled to trial, then we've sort of established a situation where no reasonable person could think cops were entitled to a trial. And that doesn't mean that they, it's anyone's obligation to fight enemy combatants. There's no army that they're obligated to do that under. There's no legitimate regime that could possibly command them to, and it would be dangerous and stupid. You know, I, I think it's... If I was a parent right now, I would be very worried about my kids if I thought they were involved in like burning down police precincts, and I would encourage them not to do so. But it would not be at all motivated by the moral sense that it was not virtuous to burn down police precincts. I would have no qualms that it is virtuous to burn down police precincts, and no qualms that as a parent, it's my job to protect my children from getting carried away with virtuous but dangerous, somewhat performative behaviors. It's an interesting perspective. I, got, I must say, I am considerably more uh, sympathetic to the police. Uh, in, in part, of course, part of that is just personal history. I come from a police family, and uh, my father was a Washington, D.C. Uh, policeman for his career and then had a second career. Uh, it's federal law enforcement. My brother is federal law enforcement. One of my closest first cousins was uh, local law enforcement. Uh, and so I, and two of my best friends just retired after 30 years as uh, uh, police officers in Washington, D.C. And I know a lot of cops and I know a lot about cop culture and the vast preponderance of cops are solid, decent, actually wonderful people with great uh, willingness to put their own lives on the line for all of us. And keep in mind, there are 700,000 policemen in the United States, 700,000, right? If you had 1% bad, which would be a remarkably low number in any bureaucracy I ever worked in, that'd be 7,000 bad cops. And it's probably bigger than that. And, you know, with humans dealing with life or death situations, high pressure, and I'm going to tell you another little secret, most cops ain't too bright. The average IQ of a cop's 105. Uh, little in the little in still better than a school teacher. Yeah, uh, yeah, not not too good. Uh, and uh, but yeah, maybe better than a school teacher. I don't know. Don't know that number. But so anyway, here we have people of slightly above average intelligence. Some of them obviously below average because we're talking about a distribution. Inevitably, some number of bad apples get through the screening process. To my mind, to say that uh, one clearly depraved event should signify. Uh, that it's okay to burn down police stations uh, strikes me as uh, grossly excessive. So I want to say a few things. First of all, I'm not saying it's okay to, to burn down police officers. And I'm not saying it's okay to burn down police stations. I'm saying it's virtuous but stupid to burn down police stations. Your parents should drown you. Um, you said it was morally okay, though. That's what I would object. No, it's, it's, more, it's morally weakly imperative. But many things are morally weakly imperative, like not eating factory farmed meat. You don't want to blame people for, not eating, for eating factory farmed meat. You don't want to blame people for burning down police stations. You probably don't even want to blame people for, as people, um, lynching a black man slowly on camera in the sense that they weren't arrested for several days afterwards. And you don't want to blame people as people for fighting for the Nazi regime, you know, in the same way. You don't want to blame people as people for participating in a system that regards what they were doing as normal and okay, even when it's murderous. But you want to, like, get them therapy for their trauma take them out of their job, relocate them to different states with felony convictions but no jail time, and give them a good $2,000 a month basic income. And maybe, you know, I think that that's kind of the right sort of starting place. We, you, you said no, you've never encountered a bureaucracy with only 1% bad people, and I agree. The real problem is bureaucracies, not cops. To some degree, I think that this situation creates a potential foot in the door to deal with bureaucracies. So, like, a lot of people are talking about defunding police departments right now, and I think that's kind of an overkill strategy, but it's also an underkill strategy. But what I think we really need is equal rights between citizens and the police, police force. So, like, you could have an amendment where whatever your local rules are for police, 
They have to wear body cams, you have to wear body cams. They have to get a warrant, you have to get a warrant. The warrants are applied for in a blind manner, so you don't know whether the person, the people issuing it don't know whether you're a cop or not. You can be independent, you could be working for an NGO, you could be a private investigator, and you should have exactly the same investigative powers as a police detective and exactly the same constraints as a police detective. That, that seems like an appropriate way of dealing with the situation. And maybe private individuals don't aren't entitled to quite the same level of like benefit of the doubt as police for you were in a stressful situation, you were exposed to a destructive environment. We need to regard you as not a particularly bad egg, but a damaged, traumatized person who needs to be taken care of but should never be allowed to kneel a gun again. You know, the, the a private investigator who lynches someone in the street, maybe we just want to shoot him immediately and not even really think about trial. But it, for the most part, the real problem seems to be that private individuals haven't been able to investigate the police. The guy who actually killed uh, George Floyd was had previously killed someone, who had his hands up, who was a Native American. He had 16 complaints on his previous record. This isn't a problem of a bad guy. It's a problem of a bad system that super empowers bad guys, at the very least. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, there are some really bad structural problems around police unions uh, protecting uh, police officers. In fact, those of us who know something about the inside baseball about policing know that it was very significant that the officers were fired. And the reason was they were no longer protected by the union. And the unions have got these very strong contracts, which can literally forestall the prosecutors from talking to uh, the accused for several days, let alone arresting them. And so it was a, a very smart uh, inside baseball move by the mayor of Minneapolis to fire uh, the police officers so they could be dealt with in, by a law enforcement uh, more expeditiously. Uh, you know, it strikes me that misconduct of a criminal sort should not be, uh, defense against that should not be baked into a union contract. Uh, there's also a Supreme Court decision uh, that uh, has a, I forget the name, damn, I wish I could remember the name, that uh, gives police a significant amount of presumptive uh, clearance for their actions so that they're presumed at a higher standard to be innocent than a normal uh, citizen. And I think that should also be changed by legislation if necessary. Uh, yes, the cops have a... Uh, a tough job and you know they're you know uh, things will happen but they should be held to exactly the sta same level of accountability uh for actual criminal behavior do you see the other side of that where private citizens should have the exact same level of opportunity for actual investigative and prosecutorial behavior uh, it's interesting in virginia it's rare very few states do this but virginia allows private criminal prosecutions uh, any individual, any citizen in the state of Virginia uh, can bring a criminal prosecution against anybody else in Virginia uh, and has the full, uh, the same power of subpoena, et cetera, as a prosecutor. Uh, so we do have that in a very in a limited capacity in Virginia. Uh, whether you should have police powers, uh, I don't know. I have to think about that one. It's an interesting idea. Uh, it's an interesting idea. Uh, it's a little bit analogous to David Brin's interesting idea that every uh, government agency should have uh, citizen observers uh, who can uh, go to absolutely any meeting, no matter what the security clearance level is, et cetera. Uh, and while they're not allowed to blow the whistle, uh, they are allowed to blow the whistle uh, at the cost of a heavy misdemeanor conviction one year in jail. Uh, which is kind of an interesting trade-off, uh, which is if you hear something sufficiently horrifying that you're willing to spend a year in jail, uh, then uh, you can blow the whistle. I thought that was extraordinarily interesting uh, concept on how to how to police the powers that be uh, so that you don't have uh, bad faith actors because no one wants to spend a year in jail. But on the other hand, if you know about, uh, you know, consciously plotted uh Extermination of the Chinese population if there's ever a conflict between the U.S. and Russia at a time when the U.S. The Chinese do not have either nuclear weapons or delivery mechanisms or a navy. Yeah, something like, like something like that. Yeah, or frankly, even the, at the level of Snowden stuff, of massive illegal surveillance of the citizenry, right? Uh, you know, would uh, Snowden have been willing, or someone sitting at uh, Snowden's shoulders, been willing to spend a year in jail to blow the whistle? 
Probably so. Uh, but unfortunately, our laws are, are way too draconian. You know, uh, Snowden faces 30 years to life. And if I, you know, he's really smart not to come back for 30 years to life. Come back for a year in the local lockup. Fuck yeah, why not? And be a hero when you came out. Right. The problem is the laws are both draconian and capricious and extremely amorphous. I mean, the problem is that the laws aren't rules. They're norms. And fundamentally, no one expects them to be rules. But they need to maintain something like plausible deniability about that in order for the laws not to just be a race war. And so when they lose plausible deniability, it actually ends up being just a race war. So hopefully we can have peace now that we've arrested these officers. We've reestablished some level of plausible deniability. We can have new legislation to investigate these things. But, you know, having done this, it's not clear that it's still moral to burn down Minneapolis police departments. Um, now that they've been arrested, that seems like a personal take. There can be some disagreement about that. The army is still out in the streets. Police are still shooting journalists in the throat with rubber bullets, arresting journalists without cause, trampling people with horses, hitting people with uh, windows of cars as they, or doors of cars as they drive by, trapping them on bridges and beating them up as they try to escape. Police are still doing a lot of major things, but the things that they're doing are pro plausibly explainable. Well, some of them are plausibly explainable as responses to high stress situations. And the rest are plausibly as explainable as assault, not murder. And like one can, can't really expect that all of these people, police who were caught on camera by journalists, shooting journalists, etc., are going to face charges for assault. I mean, the idea of facing charges is a problem because of these laws being draconian. We actually don't have a court system anymore. We don't have rules anymore. And we don't have anything like a consistent system of punishment anymore. We have way too many people in prison and we don't want to lock up the cops any more than we want to lock up the crooks or the innocent people in prison or the people who did things that shouldn't be illegal in prison or, or the things that, you know, should sort of be illegal in a sense, like tax evasion, but where like the laws have to be draconian as a, a deterrent. You know, there are a lot of types of people who we wouldn't want to punish, but we're really bad at morality, like as a species. And like we get worse at it as we get deeper into imperial decay. Yeah, when we're and we're in late and we're in a late decay s system uh, right now. Now you, you didn't you mentioned a number of what I'd call middle and to moderate level bad actions which have occurred here, but you didn't mention the worst to my mind. And this is like the worst thing that's happened in the United States in my lifetime. And I'm an old fucker, right? I'm 66 years old. I've seen a lot. I was around for the 68 assassinations and riots and police riot in Chicago, etc. Fred Hampton. Fred Hampton was pretty bad. Yeah, and there's a whole bunch of bad things. Well, here's here's something that, even though it didn't involve death, I think was uh, a moral culpability, the worst thing I have ever seen in the United in the inside the borders of the United States, and that was Trump using uh, ordering the use of military force on American territory to clear out peaceful demonstrators in front of the Episcopal Church across Lafayette Park from the uh, White House for the, the sole purpose of him going over there and having a photo op holding a Bible backwards, right? This, this is so unconstitutional on so many levels and so dangerous. I mean, I have not been the, uh, in the club that, uh, has, you know, I thought Trump is an evil, stupid, vile human being and until late recently i figured we'd survive till january and get it get his fucking ass out of there uh but now crossing those thresholds uh i'm willing to buy into the you know trump equals hitler theory a little bit more uh than i did uh previously uh i mean the the level of outrage against our uh, our way of life, our constitutional norms, and every single thing we expect of a president uh, was just so violated by that action. Uh, you know, that would be enough to get me to participate in a passive aggressive revolution. So I can see that as the most disgusting thing that was done. That was an awfully disgusting thing. It, it, it was the thing that most clearly needs to be established as not acceptable for the future generations, other than the murder with impunity of citizens which obviously is sort of first. But um, I, I see 
I mean, personally, I feel something like past a certain point when people take symbolic evil actions, that's like a good thing because it like clarifies moral sides. And the problem is in almost in conflict in general. You might say there are people who are good at building things, but reluctant to start violent conflicts. And you have people who are bad at building things, but eager to start violent conflicts. And this pattern happens over and over throughout history, it seems to me, whether it's the Union and the Confederacy or England and Germany. Uh, There's a lot of historical incidents, and Athens and Sparta, where that basic pattern holds and the the, usually the good guys win because the people who are bad at building things and eager to start violent conflicts are so eager and so shameless that they eventually provoke a response before they've infiltrated all of the institutions and made defense hopeless and like i have been scared about that like i feel much safer as an american have with a, Trump having defiled everything our nation has ever meant and everything that Christianity has ever meant in the most unambiguous way possible, as well as telling the people to drink bleach. That, that, that seems like the sort of country where I, 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 I'm really glad Trump was elected instead of Hillary, because like she wouldn't have made it so clear that there was a very large demographic actively opposed to everything our, our culture ever Value. And I, I don't at all believe Trump equals Hitler, but like Mussolini, sure. I, I totally believe Trump equals Mussolini. Trump voters equal Hitler voters, sure. I totally believe that people who voted for Trump would have also voted for Hitler. A lot of people who wouldn't have voted for Trump would have also voted for Hitler. I mean, like Hitler was a much more charismatic monster. And like, it's really weird that someone as uncharismatic as Trump could have won an election independent of, but I guess people just want to clown. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. He's more like Caligula. Caligula was really just like a mascot, a clown. No one took him seriously, but they were willing to like put up with a moderate amount of murder and a high level of depravity for entertainment. That's what you do when, you know, you've given up on trying to be a civilized republic. Yeah, and I will say for the longest time, I put uh, Trump principally in the clown box, you know, depraved clown, evil clown, right? but clown, right? And his incompetence is uh, is so astounding. You know, for instance, if he actually were, uh, you know, a Hitler or Napoleon or, uh, or even a Mussolini, uh, the obvious play when the COVID-19 uh, epidemic came on would uh, just go look at a few, uh, listen to a few radio broadcasts and channel FDR for three months and be guaranteed a re-election. Right. Uh, in a crisis, people gravitate towards the daddy party, the Republicans. Right. It's always been that way. Uh, and if he had acted just, you know, even a little bit like FDR or Churchill uh, and been a mature adult and, you know, gave the bad news and but gave hope, you know, all the things that a reason any reasonable leader would have done. Uh, any president we've had ever would have done even, right? Uh, Warren G. Harding, if he'd done a tolerable imitation of Warren G. Harding, he probably would have won re-election. But no, he's incapable of it. He is such an obviously demented character uh, with his all-galactic uh, scale narcissism and God knows what other serious mental illnesses. He couldn't even pull off a simple uh, acting job for three months to get himself re-elected. Uh, and you know, that, that, you know, shows me that he's capable of pretty much anything so long as it feeds his, his narcissistic personality disorder. And that could include going further down the road than I thought he might, you know, that, and that this uh, recent depraved event at the Episcopal church, uh, demonstrated that he's willing to cross lines that nobody's ever crossed before. So... At some point, I want to move back from Trump to the Trump voters, and as I said, the many Hillary voters who would have also voted for Hitler, because that and towards the from the police towards the bureaucracies, because that's where I do think the real problem is, and that's why I'm particularly excited about this particular proposal I've been making of just full police powers for everyone, and um, but you know we can limit police powers as much as we want, but like the ability to investigate Wall Street like privately as an individual and bring criminal charges against Wall Street when the stock market is up during the worst economic disaster of all time, actually, like definitely worse than the Great Depression at this point. Um, 
it seems kind of weird for the stock market to be way up. There's a lot of market manipulation going on. Um, the last thing I wanted to try to say about Trump, although I don't want to try to get the last word so you can go, go back, is he seems to have always been not saying there's going to be hard times that we're going to make through at. Yeah. Instead, he seems to have insisted and driven in a very hard way through the, from the top down in a way that strongly pressured all of his advisors to go along with bullshit that there was only going to be a 60,000 casualties back when no one, everyone knew that that couldn't be possible and everyone knew that that couldn't remain secret for even a couple of weeks. And I think an interesting thing is the only way I can make sense of that is basically market manipulation. It seems like there's this giant market rally, there's vast amounts of funds that are dumping into the market. All of the insiders are pulling out into cash and all of the semi-insiders are going into the least valuable assets in the market. It, it basically makes me think that, we, that our economy is much, much, much more centrally controlled than I had any reason to believe growing up. You know, like not that much less centrally controlled than the Soviet Union was. And, you know, the, the Jeffrey Epstein thing makes me think our media is not that much less centrally controlled than the Soviet Union was. Now, these sorts of things seem like the things that we need to root out, or if we can't root them out, just come to clarity about them. Like if we could just recognize that the stock market is like a lottery for real, it is for stupid people, it is just for taking their money, buy and hold is also for stupid people. Nobody ever made money by betting against Berkshire Hathaway until now, but it's a damn good bet that betting against Berkshire Hathaway is a great idea in the next next couple of years. That sort of thing. Yep. And uh, I think, you know, and again, those sort of stack some bricks up to our, to your original theme that if we you know stack these bricks and bring them to the public attention, maybe it motivates enough people to move their needle into passive aggressive revolution. Uh, you know, the threshold, as you pointed out, you know, the threshold of passive aggressive revolution is a lot lower than going out on the street, throwing Molotov cocktails, taking the risk of a rubber bullet in the throat or possibly worse. Uh, so, I think that is actually the most interesting aspect of this idea of passive aggressive revolution is for the individual agents. And let's think about from an agent based modeling perspective, uh, the risk to the agents pretty low. Uh, and yet if there were indeed collective action, the result could be pretty high and stacking these outrages one on top of the other may at some point reach a critical mass where the agents are able to switch their state from, you know, just being ordinary Joe's following their nose through life. Uh, to now aligning to the passive aggressive revolution, right? There's that whole CIA document on how to sabotage a bureaucracy, but you know, just by calling for too many meetings, and you, you've seen that, right? I have not. So, like, this famous declassified, yeah, thing. So, like, there's a lot of material out there, like that. I've actually done it though, but you know, just by native skill. So you know, I know how to do that. Right? Oh, tell me about that. What are some good stories? Uh, nah, we won't. We won't tell those stories. They take too long. We all got a few minutes anyway. So. All right, so let's deal with the voters. People who voted for Trump wanted to burn the country down. Well, no, let's stop. Let's stop. Uh, I know a lot of Trump voters. I live in an electoral district where 75% of the people voted for Trump. 75%. And that's a district that normally goes about 67, 68% Republican. Mr. Robot, Mr. Robot is a story promoting, uh, story glamorizing terrorism promoting Arab terrorism even, unifying with Chinese and American domestic terrorism to destroy the American system. And this was like mainstream family television in America. I think a lot more than 75% of the people in this country want to burn it all down. They just like don't really know what's the most effective way of doing it. But no, I would say, so I know these Trump voters and uh, they're a, a complete mixed bag. I would say maybe 10% at the most, or are not so much burn it all down, as disgusted all political, pol all politicians, and they saw this as an opportunity to stick a uh, metal rod in the spokes of the bicycle of politics, right? Uh, part of them are uh, what I call economic left behinds, who are uh, more or less legitimately, at least from their own perspective, uh, appalled by the impact on them and then their community and their opportunities for their children of globalism, you know, of hyperfinance, uh, hyperglobalism. Uh, and I think uh, 
uh, another chunk were uh, sincerely fundamental or, or at least uh, fundamental, probably overstated, strong traditional religious backgrounds who are appalled at their vision of the uh, uh, public morality of uh, urban Democrats, essentially. I don't believe that. Trump is a, an urban Democrat of exceptionally public low morality. I don't believe they're voting for him for that reason. I know these people, right? How many people t- mentioned the North Carolina uh, transgender bathroom issue? Quite a few. Uh, well, so I think you're, you know, this, you're probably over, uh, over stereotyping the Trump voter. Everything happens at the margin. You know, one of the things we know in both political science and in economics is everything happens at the margin. So the, the Trump voters are not ready on most of them to vote for Hitler. Maybe five or ten, five or ten percent might vote for Hitler, but uh, uh, they were certainly willing to vote for Trump. And but on the other hand, uh, so I don't think there's the slightest chance of that. Like the German voters who voted for Hitler were not voting for Hitler because they wanted genocide or because they wanted world conquest. They were voting for Hitler because they were desperate. They didn't have any idea and they were scared. And he seemed like a thug. And thugs are what people who have been traumatized turn to when they're scared. Yeah, that, that, that may be good. Yeah, that uh, that's a, that's an interesting analysis. The people, who, especially the ones who have uh, been traumatized by globalization and hyper financialization, said, "Okay, this guy sort of sounds like he's on our side, and he sort of th- seems like a thug." So, hey, let's hire our own thug to go kick the butts of the of the globalists. Uh, that might be a third of the Trump voters. Uh, and then here's the most interesting: is the 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 most dangerous. And this is, of course, you know. Talking about Schickle Gruber again, or Hitler, I like to call him Schickle Gruber just because it drove him crazy. Uh, that was the the name his father's name before his father changed his name at like the age of forty. Uh, uh, could, could you imagine Heil Schickle Gruber? It would not have worked too well. Uh, apparently, it sounds very very uh, humorous in German. Schickle Gruber Heil would never have flown. But uh, so German last names at that time were often based on your class origins because at some point they implemented last names, I believe, and people had to buy them. And more classy sounding last names cost more. Interesting. Uh, but yeah, his father was a government bureaucrat, a customs uh, officer of middle rank. He was not poor, uh, and he changed his name at about the age of forty. But anyway, as I was saying, the other more interesting and dangerous and interesting parallel is, in my view, about a third of Trump voters are uh, cynical people who who actually saw through Trump and realized in reality he would just be a, a, a monkey's paw for the financial interests, you know, as, as demonstrated by the tax cut, right? That damn thing uh, was the greatest shoveling of money into the wealthy people's pockets of all time, probably. But I mean, Hillary would have also been a tool of the financial interests. In the long term, the financial interests would have definitely made more money with like, you know, Democratic regime that collapsed 10 years later than with the Republican regime that collapses 10 years earlier, don't you think? Uh, these aren't, of course, the money people. Money people actually were opposed to Trump. Uh, Wall Street vote, uh, bet put their uh, contributions about five to one, four, four to one against Trump. But these are people who of uh, upper middle class, uh, successful business people, net worth of a few million, uh, and they say, "Ah, Trump will cut my taxes." And oh, by the way, probably Trump will be good for the stock market. And he did both, right? Stock market soared. Oh, yeah. I will say those guys net worth of a few million, that's not 13% of the voting public. It's much less than that. The ones are on the road to that also. So including, you know, the small small business people who when they retire will have a net worth of $2 million. There's a fair number of those. So the elephant in the room, I feel, that we haven't mentioned for Trump voters is the white nationalists, especially when we're talking about Hitler. That seems like a natural thing to bring up. I mean, this country was explicitly half white nationalist or a third white nationalist much more recently like within living memory, while Germany was not Nazi within living memory. And it transitioned without a denazification program or anything equivalent to that. It transitioned in a messy way that people still felt morally validated, but felt like they had to shut up. So it doesn't really make a lot of sense to imagine that all of the people who changed their stories about what they believed back in the 60s and 70s changed in a deep way, how they were disposed to behaving. They became like soft white nationalists who were ashamed of it in some way, but also angry that they were ashamed of it and wanted to inflict shame on other people. And that that sort of a pattern, it's way too many people to reasonably blame. It's, it's a culture, it's a bad culture, and it, there's not that much that 
can obviously be done about a bad culture except being clear that it's out there and that people actually have to take fairly large steps to protect themselves from it because they can't be protected by a system of policing and punishment because the system of policing and punishment doesn't have non uh, draconian measures and doesn't have the ability to apply draconian measures against the number of people who are engaged in these sorts of bad behaviors. So I think about what would have happened if a Jewish person had been lynched in Germany in public on video while four cops watched and one cop did it. And I think like everyone would be without unit unified against the world, saying that, okay, Germany needs to do a total overhaul and re-implement denazification. And I don't really see why this situation is different. And we've got some historical precedent for somewhat effective truth and reconciliation issues around white nationalism, like another sort of passive aggressive thing that I can imagine calling for. And let, let's say I am calling for it is for South Africa to call for the um, anti-apartheid sanctions against the, to be implemented against the United States with all the stringency with which they were implemented against South Africa until it, you know, pays them a $10 billion consulting contract to advise it on truth and reconciliation. That, that should be in everyone's interests, I think. I mean, actually everyone's is even in the interests of the white nationalists because truth and reconciliation is helpful. The, the people need understanding that they actually literally don't know how to like get over the indoctrination and culture that they were raised in. They don't know how not to hate. Hatred doesn't feel like, I want to hate people. It feels like something natural and desirable from the inside. It feels like the thing you have to do that would be meaningful. Like, how did those cops feel while they were watching someone you know, lynch a person in front of them? I'm sure they felt anxious and terrible and confused, but they, in some perverse way, I wouldn't say felt like they were doing the right thing, but felt like they were doing the thing they had to do. Two out of the four were persons of color, right? Uh, one was Hmong and the other was, I think, uh, part uh, East Asian. Uh, and so again, the, the, the thing is even more fucked up, uh, than we think, right. Uh, that it's not as simple as that. Uh, uh not unfortunately, cause that would actually, actually the solution to the legacy white supremacy of America, uh, is just the calendar. Right. And if you look at the Gallup polls in 1960, 85% of Americans believed, uh, so if someone uh, near to them married someone of another race, they would be upset. Uh, the current number is 8% uh, and declining. And then you're right. There are some people that are sub Rosa that won't tell even an anonymous poster that. Uh, but it's all on an age gradient. Uh, and, of course, to your hypothesis, uh, that's why one of the reasons Trump way stronger with old people than he is with young people. So uh, the the white supremacy thing, the calendar will take care of it. There's no constituency at all for white supremacy uh, in young people other than a few fringe nut jobs. Uh, and I don't believe that. I, I don't believe that. I think that the bro culture is a white supremacist culture. It's very hard to communicate what bro culture is. And it's, it's a weird sort of rainbow coalition white supremacist culture where like it's happy to accept african americans who are able to conform extremely well to its norms it's happy to accept jews if they're able to conform very well to its norms but it's not happy to accept something like proportional people and it demands a higher level of conformity to norms and it's willing to commit unlimited violence against people who are not part of those norms uh without feeling at all guilty about it I don't know anything about bro culture. I got to tell you, I fortunately retired before that became a thing. So, uh, uh, you know, as far as I can tell, that didn't become a thing until about 2000, 2001. I was out of the business world at that point. So I never had to deal with any of them, uh, them motherfuckers. All righty. I think we're here at our, we're here at our stop point. Any final thoughts before we sign off? This has been interesting and a curious tour of various ideas and possibility. So you've been involved in chaos theory for a long time. And you're in an unusually good place to give a scientific opinion about whether a unified day of prayer against the American military would have effects on um, its effects. Is this a great place to demonstrate the power of prayer and establish it for all time as a scientific fact? <laughs> uh, 
I think, I think about that one. You know, it, uh, it depends on, it depends on like so many things in complex systems. It depends on many different dimensions of analysis. I mean, to pray against the military, let's say to pray against the military in World War II, not going to work too well, right? Because uh, they're going to assume it's just a, a number of cranks. Uh, if the military had were actually called out and were slaughtering people uh, in the inner cities, then I think it probably would work pretty well because the cops, the the police would, uh, the military would know they're doing wrong, and so they would be accessible to the message. Uh, far more people would be willing to participate in such a prayer. Uh, so as I is entirely context dependent. How about for the stock market to decline? How well would that work? If your theory that it's all manipulated is correct, not at all. Good point. I feel that's a good place to sign out. Thank you. All righty. Good job. Talking with you. Production services and audio editing by Jared Jaynes Consulting. Music by Tom Muller at modernspacemusic.com.